So David is the founder and creator of this field he invented, which I think is so amazing, called narrative coaching. And uh, it's offered through WBEX. We'll give you the information specifically on, on how you can find out more about that at the end of the, the podinar. He's a master coach and a thought leader for the Internet, for the uh, in, uh, Institute of Coaching. He's editor of the philosophy and practice of coaching. He's a PhD, hence the doctor part. Uh, of human and organizational development and he's author of the amazingly brilliant I can say it because I've read and experienced it um, narrative coaching bringing new stories to life so uh, I'm gonna let's I'm gonna come back and look at the end of our poll okay so let's look at the results can you see the results of the poll David I can okay so we've got 14% have attended training one I'm fairly familiar, somewhat familiar, and yeah, so barely and not, so over 50%. So new audience for us. Great. Yay, yay. So, um, you know, I, I just want to start by just telling you how genuinely grateful I am hmm. for, for, for you and for this work. Um, uh, there was, there was a long time when I felt like there was something wrong with me and my coaching. Hmm. And I uh, bought into this idea that, um, that, you know, you had to have a contract, you have to have an agreement. Like, and if you can't, you know, get an agreement well, and, and in the coaching session and get a contract that, that there's something wrong. And, and I could never get over this feeling um, that I was pursuing my own agenda. Mm. And, and so there's just, anyway, I could go on and on, but I won't. I, I have um, just been relieved by how, um, just how organic and how natural close coaching can feel. And, um, and I don't feel so wrong anymore. Mm-hmm. For what felt natural, right? But felt I was like fighting my instincts. So thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. So um, where did narrative coaching come from? Hmm. <clears throat> so is that a rhetorical question? Do you actually? No, want I don't. No, I'm curious about. I'm really. I'm curious about what the origin hmm. story is. Yeah. Um. So, sort of like you, I um. Uh. I. Um, I found my way sort of accidentally, accidentally into coaching 20, almost 25 years ago, maybe now. And, um, and I was intrigued by coaching, but I wasn't very attracted to some of the early coaches I met and it all seemed a bit not like me. So I thought I can't really fit into this field. And, um, and then I had an opportunity to create, um, uh, a capstone program for a management certificate for a client that I was working with through the university. And I discovered I, they had never done anything like this before. I was the first cohort. So I thought I'll make up a coaching program for them. And there were no coaching books really, or there's a nothing. And I thought I'll just make up something. And it was extraordinarily well received. And I thought, Oh, <laughs> I like coaching, but I'm just going to do it this way. Not the way I was observing at that point in coaching's evolution. Um, and so then I finished my PhD uh, around, around coaching, built the narrative coaching model from that. Um, and t- two things stand out about that for me. So one was um, making a space for all the people who would like to coach a different way by spending the last 20 years of academic digging, writing, thinking, arguing, debating, to make space that m- many others now have Um, filled enormously with somatic based coaching and various forms of evidence and so I I felt like I created a safe space to continue to reimagine what coaching could become so people like you and I could be at our best Um, Mm -hmm. and the second thing that uh, was really important in those early days uh, almost 20 years ago now was um, challenging one of my own narratives about myself I have a long history in my family of of uh, the ultimate value is modesty. One shall not stand out at all costs. 
And it's why I did so well in Australia because they, it's a land of don't be a tall poppy. He said, cool, these are my people. <laughs> and uh, my dad had passed away uh, right before I finished my PhD. So he never got to see me graduate, which was really a tragedy for me at the time. Mm. He was the one person in my family who could really appreciate what a PhD meant. So I decided to dedicate the PhD to him. And then I thought uh, of how much he had sort of held himself back, even though he had a very successful career. I mean, and, uh, but never really believed in himself in the way that I saw him. Mm. And I realized that he too was this sort of curse around one should never uh, stand out and really get credit for what one has done. So I said, enough of that. I'm, I'm done with that. And I just had my daughter, uh, we had our daughter at that point, And I said, I'm not going to pass that on to her. And so I said, I'm going to go make something out of what I've created. So one day at my desk, I said, I'm going to start narrative coaching today. And I did. Oh, my gosh. And then I thought, oh, there's some kind of like committee I have to go get permission from. And I thought, no, no, <laughs> the old story. <laughs> I'm just going to make this up. And then I thought, I, and I, I sort of reviewed in my mind all the great psychologists I'd studied for years and years and years. And I thought, they didn't wait for permission. As a matter of fact, they actually fought to create the space for their idea. And so I thought, I want to join the ranks of those people. Yeah. yeah, 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 I love that. That's inspiring. So, so, so what's the, what is, what's the role that story plays in our lives? Yeah, the so story, um, it's really at the heart of our identity. So our identity is in large part a, a, a mashup of, uh, of narratives. Um, many we're born into because of our gender, our identity, our sexual identity, our culture, our location, our time in history, uh, some things like, what does it be, mean to be a man or a woman? What is an American? What is a good American? Um, how does one be a proper neighbor? Um, and so all these things that uh, really shape who we are early in life in ways we often don't understand. Um, and so stories help us to articulate these narrative patterns and threads that, um, that form who we are. And so one of the things we do in narrative coaching is that before we try to embark on a, a change process with anyone, we want them to be at um, a higher level of awareness and peace. What is the story you're telling yourself now? And what we find is that that's actually a significant portion of the transformative process. It's not some gigantic breakthrough or some big thing they've got to go chase off in the future. It's like, like, what if I just sat still and, and said, like I did to myself, I'm really tired of this family story about my family and myself. I've held myself back for too long. I'm not going to do that anymore. So what story do I want to tell myself? I'm the somebody who really celebrates what he's worked his ass off to go, go, go do. And I want to bring this to the world. So, um, and so then when you form a new story for yourself, you, you start to talk differently. You stand differently. You start meeting different kinds of people. I found my early tribe in the academic story space before I even tried it in coaching. And so stories are just the vernacular. It's the medium by which we uh, evolve our identity. We connect to each other. We find our place in history. We build sense and meaning. And it's just the most natural and ancient of human forms of uh, being in the human community. Yeah. 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 So uh, if you would um, talk through like um, how story is used in, in narrative coaching and you know, the, the model yeah. of narrative coaching. So w w one of our, our core, our number one principle is that everything you need is right in front of you. Everything. And so what we're trying to do is um, help coaches recognize there's massive science behind all this, but in really it's the art makes it so wonderful. And to help us realize that when somebody is telling us a story in coaching, they're trying to make sense of something or um, get to meaning of something. And they don't really know um, kind of how to, what's, what that's about, which is why, as you, as you know, we don't, uh, tend to set goals in coaching because I don't find those very useful for most people. Certainly in the beginning of coaching, I have absolutely no interest. I've been coaching for over 20 years. It's rare that we ever come close to ending a conversation anywhere near where we began. 
<laughs> and so uh, most of us don't know why we're really in coaching. Uh, we have a, a, usually a rationale or uh, um, a, an incident or something, but it's really what we're really there to do it gets revealed to us. And the stories are basically the doors into those rooms. And so like we, we really support our coaches to realize you don't, people can tra transform without crying, for example. You don't have to <laughs> You don't have to have the big breakthrough or the, the big life-changing story. It's in many of my most powerful sessions uh, were around very simple anecdotes or stories, but then getting them to like really drop into the experience of where that came from and how that feels. And, and I know at the retreat you went to, you know, watching the very brief encounter that that man had with his three chairs. And we didn't really have much context of anything. We didn't, because we don't need lots of information. The story's doing its work through him. And he himself was shocked. Like within like three or four minutes, he's like, he was so moved by something that we had no idea what had happened for him. <laughs> so true. I remember seeing your, your so dog, like, <laughs> I was like, what just happened? And, it, and it's because the story, and, and part of that is that the, um, the story's on a mission for the person. The story is trying to draw the person's attention to something they're not seeing or are afraid to see or excited to see but can't. And so the story starts coming out in their posture or their changes in their gestures or their face. or And all we're doing, not all, but what we're doing that, uh, is just witnessing what the story is trying to bring out into the room mm -hmm. and helping almost like midwife that so it can show up. Yeah. And yeah. then stand, stand there and witness with the client what they just did. Yeah. Yeah. yeah what you said that just so resonated with me is, is just like the, like the story is on a mission. Yeah. And, 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 you know, it, it, I think at some level before narrative coaching, I, I, I got maybe, uh, conceptually this idea that we are every character in the story we mm -hmm. in the stories we tell i kind of got yeah. that but it wasn't until um until i started understanding how to bring those characters into the coaching itself and have the characters coach the client yeah that that i finally got it yeah that i really like yeah, we're we're the story, you know. We're the I, the way I think about it is we're the, the the I'm the Sherpa of the story. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Right, just like okay, story, do your work. You're wanting to do that work anyway. Yeah, yeah. How do we get out of the way or facilitate it or guide yeah. it? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, so, as you know, a lot of coaches will um, get in their. Uh, we'll have a question about like, gee, how do you, like, how do you sell coaching into an organization when there's no coaching agreements and no goals? Yeah. Can, can you speak to how you deal with that? Yeah, it's, it's uh, tricky. Um, and uh, just as a practical tip, what I, what I've done well for myself is I, I just demonstrate what I do in the interview. I coach the, the person interviewing me and that, and they go, and they go, Oh, we'd like some of that. <laughs> Uh, okay. I'll have what you have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. It's, it's um because often you're interviewing either a business leader who doesn't really understand coaching or an HR person who's got a, a thousand things to do that day and trying to just you know it becomes too mechanical sometimes. Um, and uh, so we just try to demonstrate it. We try to um, talk to them about adult development and how that really happens and that. Um, uh, and one of the things that's really appealing to narrative coaching is we can actually, which I demonstrate to them consistently in these interviews, I can help your clients get to what really matters to them in much less time because we're not going to be chasing goals or building plans or we're trying to figure out what's the narrative that's getting in their way. For, um, and, and there could be skills or, or resources they need to go access, but fundamentally it comes down to for most people, if you've been around um, leadership long enough, you've been to plenty of trainings, you've read plenty of books, you know, you've gone to plenty of whatevers, and it's really about something within yourself that's making that hard to access and operationalize in, in your current work context. And so we just tell them that we, we, we wanna understand from the stakeholders what matters most to you, 
in terms of what success would look like for you. We do some expectation management about what's really possible in coaching. We have no special wands that were given in coaching school, right? <laughs> we're trying to change an adult's Damn. behavior, which is really difficult. Yeah. Um, and so we try to just help and just keep them appraised. And I said, when we end up with specific objectives, which we get to, but not at the beginning, uh, we will let the appropriate people know and get their acceptance and buy-in. And, and we also challenge, and we've, develop some tools to help challenge the other stakeholders uh, in terms of supporting the client to be successful. So we've got some really interesting feedback tools which get to the, um, the sort of uh, systemic nature of the narratives in which our clients live and the realization that, um, that many of our suboptimal behaviors are co-constructed with the people in that situation who often benefit from a per, um, it's perpetuating the very thing they're complaining about. <laughs> yeah. 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 You know, I, 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 uh, um, I'm going to attempt to do a blog on my use of the 720. Okay. So, so for those of you who have been blogging on, on narrative coaching for a while and, and all of, I imagine everyone who's listening has, is familiar with the, the 360 tool going in and doing 360 and what David introduced in narrative coaching was this idea of a 720 where, where um, you're working with the interaction between the leader and the team because the leader has a story about themselves and they can change that story about themselves but if their team is still locked in the prior story <laughs> they're gonna encourage that pro those prior characters to come out you know yeah, and um, the, the, then the gears just grind and the, the whole yeah. thing just sort of falls to comes to a halt yeah so anyway hopefully i'll if I can carve out the the time it was it was um yeah it's a story my 720 that that we did is is a story in itself mm. um okay so we're going to be coming to to chat think about your questions we're going to be going to the audience in just a moment um and before we do one one last um question for you Dave. yeah so one of the one of the things that uh like I love that you said, uh, at least either I said or made up that you said it, um, <laughs> is, um, is you, I think you said something like, I know what happens when you give your coaches homework after a session. Yep. Like, they don't do it. I'm <laughs> like, oh my God, thank you so much. It's not me. Yeah. You know, because my clients don't do their homework. They, no. never, they don't. They never have. And I thought, you know, it's just me. I'm not, I'm not designing the actions clearly enough. I'm not defining them right enough. I'm not getting enough at stake. I'm not, you know, anchoring them in what's important, like, right? And then I just, re like, I'm like, okay, it's actually not me. <laughs> no, it's not. So, so, so can you talk about, like, how narrative coaching kind of works with that dynamic? Yeah, so one of the underpinning principles, or, uh, authors, I guess, of narrative coaching is uh, Paulo Freire, who... Um, wrote a lot in the 70s and 80s about um, pedagogies. Um, and but from that, I take that his whole thing was that we think of in terms of school, that the experts give you stuff and you just empty it into your head and then you spit it out on a test. And he wanted to re reverse that and put people in charge of their own learning and be aware of their own stories and take have agency to transform their own stories. And what that means um, for this is we engage a lot in uh, narrative coaching, what we call serious play we play with serious issues and what we find is that it really opens people up we don't we don't take it lightheartedly where we don't make fun of serious issues but we realize that they have a very often a very rigid or contained view of how oh this is so hard or i can't ever do this or i've always been told that's true about me but i don't know what to do about that and it all begins so much and who would want to start on that journey right it's it's your you know your stuff before you even start. So we said, well, let's just put that over there and work with it in a way that's appropriate for you, but in kind of a playful way. <coughs> Excuse me. And we don't. I don't have any faith in my clients acting on what we're going to do from the session. I don't. Thank you. I don't, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah. I, I I support and some do, but I I don't want to have that be the. Um, weak link in my coaching. I don't want to have had an amazing hour with a client and then have this prayer that somehow they're going to go magically transform because they're going to run into all kinds of headwinds of 
competing narratives and demands and distractions. And so I thought, uh, and I remember I had this a breakthrough years ago with a client who, um, who consistently had not done what he said he was going to do. And I went through the whole scolding and well, what, did I do? what did I do wrong? And oh, this is ridiculous. He's a bright guy. He clearly doesn't want to do these things. If, if it mattered to him, really, he would do them. And so I thought, okay, we need to change this. And so I just said to him sort of flippantly, well, then I'm going to make you do it right now. <laughs> and, and, and he goes, what do you mean? I said, well, because there's no, at this, for this hour, there's nobody on the planet who cares about you more than I do, who is more supportive of you, knows more about how to help you. So, and if you can't do it with me right now, you're never going to do it on your own. I mean, I, I don't, <laughs> right? <laughs> Uh, so I thought, and so we, uh, I, we do a lot of work in narrative coaching, giving people new experiences they've never had before as a way to open up new, new access to themselves, new awarenesses of themselves, new freedoms to go be somebody else. And then we say, so what would that look like if you actually did that in your life? Like what conversation would, would most benefit if you could show up that way? And so, and, and we want to give people the taste of being successful. So like, for example, when I, I used to do a lot of coaching with, um, in a big, uh, big four firm, you know, these, these, all these men, uh, particularly really struggled around team development, team, you know, vulnerability, you know, all that coaching. And so I said, I want to, I don't, there's too much pressure for them to practice at work first. So I said, let's practice now. Talk to me. Like, what's, what was the hardest day of your life? You know, or we talk about our dads. Or I want to give them, to, oh, I can do this. And then who else in your life would you like to go talk to? Oh, I'd like to talk to my son. I've just lost touch with my son because he's in sports at school and I'm busy and I just don't see him anymore. And I miss the times we used to have when, you have when he was younger. And so we want to give people ex chances to experiment. Get immediate feedback, immediate support immediate scaffolding to go, what, where could you take this next? And so we're, we're, as we do throughout narrative coaching, we're walking alongside them on the journey that they're on, asking ourselves, what do they need most from me right now? Mm -hmm. That's it, right now. Mm -hmm. And then we sort of help them every, every now and then to kind of pull out, look at the, the segment of the journey they've just finished, celebrate that and say, and anchor that and say, now what? What's next for you? Yeah. 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 Cool. Okay, Chris, what are you um, seeing in the chat box? Yeah, we've had about three or four questions, and right. I'll the first one here, uh, which is from Marion Boyle, mm. asks, "How does our story relate to our purpose?" Um, well, in many ways. So, uh, our stories um, live in our whole body, not in our mind, as we often think. And so it really animates our soul, our whole soma is really a reflection of the stories we've accumulated over our life and we've made central to us. So that's one piece. But I think more importantly right now, um, you know, if I think about how life felt as a child, like when I was my daughter's age, um, you had a story about career paths that were open to you or not. And you had a sense of a future that when the world was growing after the world, second world war. And, um, and so this, you, your purpose uh, for many of us, um, um, it obviously is different depending on a lot of different factors, but you, you had a sense of direction or possibility in whatever size of scope that was. And so your story was, you were part of something, right? In the sixties and seventies, you were, different protest movements or different uh, changes, uh, bringing women into the church or doing all kinds of things. And I think now people, we're, we're just swirling a, a, a gajillion stories constantly. We're bombarded with news and information and music and sound. And, and I just, I observe in a lot of my clients that their stories just don't add up anymore. They don't seem to serve a bigger purpose. Like what, what, is, what, what is all this for? Like, what is this job I'm pushing papers around or I'm, what, what am I doing? And so I think we live in a, you know, with you look at climate change and some of the challenges we face as a planet, um, I think people are really hungry. And you see this a lot in younger people, like the, the millennial types. You see this and they're really driven by purpose. Is what I'm doing making a difference to somebody somehow? Yeah. And so a lot of what we're doing is in terms of like using narrative coaching in careers or even in, 
people at stages of life or trying to make big changes is like uh, finding the story that's bubbling, that's, that's coming out of them and, and not worrying about form yet, but like really naming that. And then seeing if they can tie that to some bigger narratives that mean a lot to them and gives them a sense of purpose. Because now my story links up to something that's bigger than me. Yeah. 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 Beautiful. Beautiful. Uh, Thanks, Chris. Chris. Yeah. Do you have another question for us? Yeah, I do. And in fact, this one I think maybe relates a little bit to where we're um, heading with this. Uh, from Erica Hoffman. Erica asks, are there specific challenges or opportunities where you find narrative coaching to be particularly helpful? And conversely, are there any situations where you found the approach not helpful? Um, well, it's, it's rare that it's not helpful, but there are situations in which it's harder for people to access narrative coaching. So I've, I've, for a lot of different obscure reasons, I've done a lot of work with IT companies and tech companies and uh, science companies and all kinds of things. And um, um, for people that don't easily access their own inner experience, that don't easily traffic in metaphors, um, that live in uh, or work in jobs that are very structured or rigid because of the nature of the job. So it's good that they're that way. Sometimes this can be difficult. They're more used to like goal setting and action planning and things having steps and one thing to do. And, and so for them, it's, it can be a bit of a stretch, but they're also just human. So we just, we find a way to find the humanity in them. And, um, and for many of them, it's quite uh, liberating to realize, no, oh, I don't have to be that way all the time. So sometimes it's just, there's, um, there, there's not a match um, in terms of how people are psychologically structured. It's harder for them to access narrative coaching in its fullest potential, but there's still wonderful things you can do for them. And I've done that for years. Um, we're, at, we're and I suppose the other challenge, um, and it's also an opportunity, we live in a time of extraordinary diversity. And so one of the things we really challenge our coaches is to be aware of your own formative habits. What are the stories you tell yourself about, uh, unconsciously often, about women or about people from a certain uh, racial background or people, white men on top of organizations and you know all kinds of stories we make up. And so I think learning to develop more sensitivity about our own uh, blind spots, our own biases, but also to, to realize that there's a lot of different forms of stories, uh, a lot of different um, endings of stories. There's, um, and so that we can be more sensitive to the diversity of the populations that we often work with. And I remember, um, just as a quick anecdote of that, I, I was doing a leadership program for a federal low income program. I'd done this for years all, all over the West Coast. And, we had like a hundred emerging leaders from all like five states or something. And we we're doing this program. And, and I, I was teaching an MBA program at the time. So I had this, I had this brilliant curriculum I'd made and this three day program and I tested it out and all this is going to be fabulous. And I got up front and then about two hours in, I thought I'm, I'm very good at sensing energies in rooms. I thought, why this is not going well. This is dying here. Like, why is this, Dying. it's so good why are they not appreciating how good this is and I thought, okay, I need to step back <laughs> this step back because you're like doing this in real time as you're doing the program right and so then i thought okay i just need to like call time out so i i just uh, put my my uh, teaching notes whatever down and just looked at the group and then i the first thing that hit me was i thought well it was the obvious thing there's 100 people in this room there's two men and 98 women of the 98 women, which was not surprising for that agency, of the 98 women, probably 50 to 60 of them were Hispanic or African American. I, uh, I would make in a year many multiples of what many of them make. Many of them came through this program themselves. It's one of the beauties of that program is it really brings people in and it trains them to actually to lead programs. So it's really quite wonderful. I said, but these come, women come from lives and places that are very different than mine. Which I sort of knew intellectually, but I said, then I really had to dig her deeper and say, this, this is the wrong program for them. So I took my binder, which uh, my version of the binder they had, opened up the rings and just dumped all my pages oh, on the floor. That's called trust right there. <laughs> yeah, and, and I said, here we go. 
And so I, and I explained to them why I was doing that. And I said, um, this, is the, this, will be the, this is the last, and it was the last leadership program I ever did that way. And I said, because this is all material written by privileged white guys. And so we're not going to, not that they don't have a lot of value, but they're not relevant to you right now. So I said, to buy myself a little time to plan the rest of my three days. <laughs> I said, I would like you to break into small groups and introduce yourself to your neighbor and tell them where you were born and tell us some things about why you liked where you were born, what was good about that, and I want you to tell us about the most powerful person in your area. What gave them power? Um, how did they get to be powerful? What, how did they use their power? And, and so we're basically going to identify uh, frames for leadership. And, um, and so, and then of course, then they, the, the whole room erupted and they all clapped, and like two hours later, they were still talking. They were still <laughs> talking. So it, was, it was fantastic. Oh, that's great. And so then we took those principles and we built the curriculum together for the other two and a half days. Oh. Oh, uh, but to the point, uh, the whole point of this is to Chris's question about using narrative coaching and diversity is a really important frame to more and more to really seriously think about. And it works well when you have people that are all in themselves and don't want to do coaching as window dressing, but are, that's the real deal. And, um, and, We've often had many people that were quite skeptical about narrative coaching in the beginning who have been our biggest converts and fans. Because oh. once they realized, oh, I'm kind of hiding out as the skeptic here. <laughs> but if I just put my toe in this water, this could actually be quite helpful for me. And yeah. so they, they became huge converts um, in the end. But yeah. Cool. So hopefully that answers cool. the person's question. Yeah. So I'm going to suggest we go into our coaching demo to make sure we sure. have plenty of time. Does that work for you? It does. Okay. Um, where shall we start? <clears throat> so are you going to tell me about what triggered you? Yes. I don't want to though. Um, actually I do. Just, I wouldn't, like have, I wouldn't have suggested it, right? But, uh, you're yeah. just modeling our clients. Yeah. They, they okay. want to change, but they don't want to change. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I had an event that triggered me mm -hmm. and, and I get, I get that it, because I'm triggered. It's definitionally about me. So I, I, I get that it's not about anyone, but, but me. And there's something, um, generally it, when I'm triggered, I can go, I can kind of go, yeah, I, that's familiar. This there's something about this particular one. That I'm, not, mm. I'm not like, I mean, I think it's a convergence of things. So, um, should I tell you the story of what, like what happened or? No. No? Okay. So um, you could, if, is that, does that feel important to you? Not really. Because no. it wasn't, it wasn't about what happened. No, it never <laughs> is. No, it never is. <laughs> yeah. but so maybe, maybe you can, as you think about that, I mean, you sort of like to scan the story as it progressed in your mind and think okay. as you notice, like, where was the moment I started to notice maybe even in hindsight, but you, you noticed that you were being triggered. Like what was happening then? So um, I was asked a question that my reaction was to feel judged by. Uh -huh. That so, was the beginning. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you felt there was an implicit judgment in uh, what yeah. you experienced? Yeah, and I'm feeling really right about it being a judgment. <laughs> I see. <laughs> yeah. So what do you make of that? What do I make of that? Well, I'm, I'm obviously judging back. <laughs> so maybe it's like, that's me. Um, yeah. Like I felt judged and so I judge back and mm -hmm. it's like dueling judges. And if you, if you were to frame that as a, uh, um, a story, so what, what were you t telling yourself that would cause you to be bothered by this? Oh, oh that's a good question. What was I telling myself? Okay, I, I don't have all of it, but I have a thread mm -hmm. of it. So, yeah. the, 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 not that it matters with the question, the question she asked was, are you, a, 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 it's out of context, but the question was, are you a therapist? And um, 
the where I where I went with that was someone in the somewhere in the direction of like it's like like I should be or like I'm not or I don't know enough that sounds right I don't know enough I should know more I sh you know but I'm not qualified to be doing what I'm doing. Mm, there you go. That sounds right. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so I'm yeah. not qualified to be doing what I'm doing. Right. That sounds right. <clears throat> and so what what kind of person does work that they're not qualified to do? Uh, 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 what kind of work? People, I can't even, I can't even come up with the word. Uh, frauds. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, imposters. Imposters, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, just dishonest people. Yeah. You know, but also, there's also another piece of, uh, like, uh, like people who know, know a thimble about something, but right. show up as if they know they have the ocean. I don't know what that means, but... Yes, those mm -hmm. two things. Okay. And so when that story became active in you, uh -huh. how did you respond in this moment? <laughs> um, well, when I first got the question, I'm like, no, <laughs> I'm not a therapist. Because like, she interrupted me with the question, uh. which was also a little irritated because I was a little irritated because we'd spent literally 30 minutes listening to her talk nonstop, uninterrupted. So I think there's also a little thing of like, like we like quid pro quo, like we listened to you and like, so there was part of, part of that, like it felt disrespectful. <clears throat> um, but, um, and I, I, what I'm fairly sure of is that there was some kind of shadow thing going on there for me because she was um, really inhabiting her selfness. Mm -hmm. And, you know, mm -hmm. this is me, this is what I'm doing, and it's awesome, and it's great, and there's nothing wrong in my entire life. And, um, yeah. And what do you call, what, is, what are some words for those people, or people in that space? The first word that comes up for me is braggart, but that doesn't quite fit it. Um, and there's a chest thumpers. That's what it is to me. Okay. Chest, chest thumpers. So yes. you've now, you now have these two stories. I'm a fraud and I'm a chest thumper. Yeah. Or I <laughs> would want to be. See, I'm not actually, that's the shadow piece. So see, I'm yeah, still I'm, not that, but... Yeah, so the fraud, the fraud was the word, the thing that was triggered in you, yeah, yeah. the judgment you felt, and yeah. the chest thumper was uh -huh. the shadow in you that was activated. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So, and so, what happened as a result of this? What was the outcome of that interaction? So there was a third piece, which was, you know, I had um, shown up as I typically do, kind of warts and all. I say these are things that are good and I also say you know and everything's you know not amazing and so I felt like I gave a balanced picture because that was kind of, to a certain extent the purpose of what we were doing was to see mm -hmm. if we could get to get help right yeah and um and what happened was so I did present some things that were that were issues or challenges and then what she did the same person was instead of giving me support or help or uh affirmation or ideas or and it, she just kind of kept she just repeated back to me the issues i said i had and so yeah thank you thank you and very so, much yeah the, and so it felt like salt in the wound it yeah. really did it felt it felt like salt in the wound yeah okay I'm sorry i'm really excited to pop it up and um what would you what would you have liked to have done to get a different outcome? Well, I mean, I would like to have not have been triggered. 
I mean, um, and, and uh, not that anything terrible happened, but it did check. I was checked out. It did check me out. Mm-hmm. Um, and and I I left feeling hurt and raw, mm-hmm. and yeah. raw, raw, which didn't feel good. Um, but I. I I totally get. I can embody more of that chest thumper. Okay, so that that's more more alive for you right now. Yeah, I mean that's like I totally could be more of that, and maybe if I was more of that, that that would. But it, that's part of it. And yeah, it just it's part of me coming to grips, like like. Like I, I'm like everything I'm doing is already enough. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So how does that sound? That sounds fraudulent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I can work on that. <laughs> of course it does. You have all your defenses are well armored uh, yeah. to protect you from that one. Yeah. Yeah. No. Yeah. So yeah. we can imagine that as the beginning of a story you could tell yourself in those moments when you feel triggered. Yeah. Yeah. Like I'm so, enough. Um, yeah. What would it be to be enough? How would being enough be in this? Right. Yeah. So let's imagine you were to ima- uh, summon up. Um, and where does this story most live in you? Hmm. Even as you're telling it uh, in this in this period, you like know, where do you feel the um, tension? Where do those stories reside? You know, the first what first comes up for me is is um, and I've never heard anyone say this before, but it's what it is. It's in my like my skin, like I um, things like that. I let leave feeling like literally like mm. raw, like yeah. Hmm. And if you were coaching somebody with raw skin, what would you wish for them or what would they, what would be helpful to them? Oh, a container. Yeah. Yeah. I'd wish for a container. Yeah. And if you could uh, create one of those for yourself in those moments, what would that look like or feel yeah. like? Yeah. I, even as I think about it, it feels good. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that feels right. Yeah, containment is something that I've been working on. And mm-hmm. I, I didn't um, I didn't recognize it at the time that containment was what I was wanting or needing. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> so when you get triggered by comments like you got in the very beginning, what would you tell yourself to remind yourself of the container? Yeah. <clears throat> Hmm. There's um, that I'm separate from them. And that's like, yeah, that, that, yeah, that's kind of like, that's what they think that doesn't, okay, that, that's a, a data point, (laughs) but it's, they're separate from me and yeah, that's just what comes up. Yeah. When my daughter was young, uh, she went to a really wonderful school and um, they had a child psychologist who did some same things for the school. And one of the things he had was these like 12, tw- uh, 12 tools for kid, young kids. She was like six, six or seven at the time. Um, and one of the tools <clears throat> is called that every child was encouraged to go create was a quiet, safe place. Mm-hmm. And so if, if, even now at 17, she still creates this for herself in her room. In the, in, the old, in the early days, it was blankets and stuffies and those kind of things, but now it's other. But he said, you know, you need someplace you can go that's not your parents, where you feel safe and happy. And if, and if it's very clear for you, then you can also summon that up if you're outside on the playground or away and you're not in your safe space. You can just imagine it and you can feel it and it's, it will be as real for you as if you were there. And she's carried that with her for, for over a decade now, that idea, and she always make sure that she has some place like that for her. And would that be great to offer that for, for our clients and for ourselves? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Um, 
Yeah. 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 There, so there's a meditation that I I have been doing um, that I can be doing more intentionally that, around containership. Yeah. I and also, would, yeah. go ahead. No, I just hadn't thought of applying it in that situation, but it's so it's so exactly what I needed. Yeah. And I would make it as specific as possible. What color is it? What's it made out of? How big is it? What's the door like? Who has the key? Um, mm, 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 yeah. Mm. And um, yeah. So is there anything else you'd like to explore or share about this for right now? No, I, I just say I feel, um, gosh, I feel um, so much more grounded. It's like literally like I feel more contained. Yeah. Like literally my skin feels yeah tighter like in a good way mm -hmm. like in, a, in a holding me in way yeah yeah right yeah and one of the things i just as a last um a little sort of uh, anchor for you um sometimes like if you're in a meeting like maybe it's an interview for a, a gig or a debrief for a significant person and that energy starts to come up in the room. Part of it, you can visualize it in your, mm. do a whole body piece, but also sometimes like I do this even for myself, I'll just put my hand, I'll just like put my hand on top of the other hand and just touch skin to skin and just say, I, you know, I, I will create the boundaries for myself. Mm. So I feel safe right now. So I need to pay, pay attention and to, to care for myself. And just that skin to skin contact just grounds me. Mm. And reminds me about my own container, if you will. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and, and which helps when in a moment where you can't to say, I'm not going to meditate for five minutes. <laughs> right, right. I'll come yeah. back to you. You can activate it some, through some other somatic cue. Yeah. 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 Oh, good. Yeah, good. All right. Well, thanks for, I appreciate you being willing to yeah. share all that. Yeah. Well, thank yeah. you for, yeah. for the containment. <laughs> okay. So um, how about we go, Chris, won't you let us know what's going on in the chat? If there's anything David and I need to, to want to respond to here before we wrap up. Yeah, we've had a lot of really nice appreciative comments for both of you. And from Ann Herschel, we said, she says, since we could all use some safe space, it would be lovely to hear Allison's meditation. Would you like? Oh, you know, um, it, it's it's um, well. I mean, I'll tell you about it. It's recorded, and and, and I'll tell you, it's. Um, I'm working with a shaman right now, and um, the shaman um, recorded it for me, and it and it's it is um, in essence, and because it's not mine and it's not perfect, but in essence, it it takes energy from the sky and it takes mm -hmm. energy from below and it, and it takes that energy and just literally wraps it almost like a bubble around me where there's energy coming down through me and coming back up from the sky and the same thing from below. And it's, it's called a golden, I don't know, like mm -hmm. golden yeah. containment. I can't remember what it's called, but, but anyway, so it, that's, um, yeah, so so bringing that up back in my mind of this um, connected yet contained. Um, yeah, so sorry I can't be more specific. I don't know, David, what comes up for you? No, but I was just going to add to that because I've studied a lot of that as well. And so one of the um, practices I use a lot because it is um, – there's a belief system in a lot of those traditions that the earth is more feminine in a way and is a very grounding for us, which we often are not anymore in our current, we live in our phone. Um, and that the ability to move heavy energy from the room or a conversation into the ground again. And because as coaches, we often encounter people in distress and, you know, in difficult situations. And so there's a lot of heaviness sometimes in, with some of our client conversations. And so um, for me, the um, being able to um, move that out of the system so it doesn't c contaminate or you know sort of uh, overwhelm our space, our coaching space, is really important. And, so, and then we can bring in some more light from above. Um, 
And it, it's really, in the narrative coaching, we talk a lot about the field that we work, we're working in. It's three-dimensional. There's all kinds of things happening in the conversation. And we're just trying to figure out what needs to happen in this space that would be healing or enlightening or problem resolving or whatever the client needs uh, at, at that point in time. So. Thank you.